So one more time, uh, good afternoon and uh, uh, thank you for participating in the conference Fences, Walls and Trenches, Free Movement as a Human Right uh, on the occasion of the Václav Havel Human Prize uh, 2016. Uh, and we will continue with the first part of our afternoon program and I apologize for a slight misprint in our original program. There were two panels, two and three, called by the same name and that was obviously uh, a mistake. Now we have replaced the page in the program with the proper names of the two panels. Uh, uh, the last one is now correctly openness or closeness of the EU, but uh, this panel is uh, a panel about Brexit. And we gave it a little dramatic uh, name, Who Lost the United Kingdom? Uh, this is obviously a paraphrase of the famous uh, Who Lost China uh, question. Uh, but uh, our primary concern will not be, I suppose, with the political decision uh, uh, by the British electorate to uh, opt for leaving the European Union, but uh, with uh, the repercussions uh, uh, which speak uh, to the topic of our conference. Uh, will Brexit mean a new uh, trenches, walls, fences uh, in Europe, or can we, uh, on both sides, manage Brexit without uh, uh, erecting too many obstacles? And uh, speaking on this issue, I have, uh, I think, two very competent uh, speakers. One is uh, uh, a person of uh, dual loyalties. Eva Jiřičná, as uh, most of you know, is a native of Zlín in this country, but has uh, lived in the United Kingdom since uh, the 60s, started a very successful architectural company, which is today the Eva Jiřičná Architects, uh, is uh, uh, a laureate of many architectural awards and prizes, but Unlike uh, many of her colleagues, uh, she's not a fach idiot, as we say in this country. She's not limited her perspective to building uh, houses and uh, thinking about architectural matters, but she's a social, socially conscious uh, personality as well. And Martin Wollacott is... Uh, a preeminent uh, British journalist, a uh, former uh, foreign correspondent, foreign editor and foreign commentator, still a foreign commentator on uh, many subjects of The Guardian and, uh, and uh, on a number of uh, international topics and uh, Brexit may sound like a domestic issue, but it's not as we all know. So. Uh, and final remark, uh, this is a reduced panel. Originally, there were supposed to be three speakers there. The third one uh, was uh, Mr. Proza, the uh, Secretary of State in the office of the Prime Minister, and we invited him because we were uh, very keen to hear what uh, uh, the Czech government thinks about uh, how... Uh, the consequences of Brexit should be managed, but unfortunately he sent his regrets uh, yesterday for personal reasons, so we will have to do without him. So, uh, with this, maybe I will start with the Brit, uh, uh, Martin. Okay, I'm on. Well, I hesitate to subvert the chairman so early in the process, but um, I am going to look backwards and, of course, try to look forwards. I want to look backwards because I think 
what happened in Britain um, over Brexit uh, illuminates what may happen in the future. And I think the almost accidental nature of the way in which this disaster came about is a very important thing to remember. <clears throat> I've therefore gone about the question of who lost Britain in the manner of a detective story. As I say, this is not to be too light-hearted. This is a disaster. As Michael Ignatieff said this morning, and as most people agree, for Britain and for Europe, but nevertheless, to look at the causation is really rather important. I, one has to say, as in all these things, causation is absolutely complex, it's always multiple. But I've broken it down, in my mind, to five factors. A sequence, a man, an institution, a context, and a tradition, five factors. I'll begin with the sequence, which for me starts with the Scottish referendum. A Scottish referendum belongs in the same family, in my view, uh, of votes uh, and of popular politics uh, to which the vote for Brexit in Britain belongs. It's in the same family of rejection of current political arrangements, disillusion with the political dispensation, in some cases a political dispensation with which people have been satisfied for a long time, in the case of Scotland, for 300 years. Um, it, was, it, was, it was not a success. The uh, Scottish nationalists did not win their referendum. They came fairly close, but they did completely changed the balance of British politics because the outcome of the ref referendum was the collapse of the Labour Party in Scotland. The collapse of the Labour Party in Scotland then contributed toward a different outcome in the next general election and that allowed David Cameron to emerge from that election without a Liberal ally and in charge of the government on his own without in in any other situation, it would have been very unlikely that he would have gone for a referendum, or had he gone for that referendum, that he would have gone about it in the same way. He felt he was strong enough to win it, and therefore he went for it, taking a risk, but he thought that risk was containable. So that's the sequence which led us to the referendum. The man who I think can be deemed without calling out guilty in any legal sense to be most responsible for the vote was the Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn. Because Mr. Corbyn, coming out of a left-wing tradition in Britain and in Europe as a whole, which has always been somewhat skeptical of the European Union as a capitalist, essentially a capitalist enterprise, campaigned for the Remain camp in a let's say, a restrained way. Some would say a lukewarm way. Certainly not effective. He had been enormously good at energizing the Labour Party's political base, indeed restoring it, but he was not anything like as good at mobilizing that base to vote for Remain. And that, that difference on the Labour side probably made the difference to the outcome. So the man, the man in the crosshairs, in my view, is Jeremy Corbyn. The institution that can be held responsible is the BBC, one of the great institutions of Britain and one with many virtues. But its attachment to a kind of legalistic idea of impartiality led it to too often allow the Leave campaign to get away with distortions, exaggerations, and sometimes even outright lies. There's a parallel to this process in the United States going on at the moment as the serious American press wakes up to the fact that dealing with Mr. Trump as if he was an ordinary candidate and giving him, as it were, 
equal time and equal attention and treating him with equal seriousness uh, to uh, Mrs. Clinton has been a, a misuse of the media's resources. The BBC, in a media landscape in Britain where the popular press is largely Eurosceptic, one of the major serious titles is also Eurosceptic, I'm speaking of the print press, uh, should have seen its job as to tilt the whole media balance toward uh, a, fa a fairer, more level playing field. It didn't do that, and that, I think, would have added a few more points, as it were, on the scale against a remain outcome. So that's, that's, a, that's a sequence, that's a man, that's an institution, then the context. The context is the one which has been touched on again and again today, it's the obvious one. The multiple crisis that has overcome Europe, the European Union, war in the Middle East, um, terrorism, Russian, becoming increasingly willful and problematic in its relationship with Europe, <coughs> an economic crisis which is hardly over, has been only patched up by measures which themselves are pre productive of worse social troubles as in Greece. And this all penetrates uh, in a diffuse way to electorates. And British electorate may not be enormously aware of the detail of these things. All it knows is that Europe has not been doing very well in dealing with these crises. And unlike in some other European countries, if you look at the Eurobarometer, which comes out regularly, you see a constant of a sort of support for uh, the European Union amongst most Europeans, <coughs> contrasting with an up and down in its actual popularity. But the, the, the base of, a, of support, a kind of weary support perhaps, remains reasonably strong. In Britain, I think the idea that Europe was not handling things well in any of the, any of the different facets of the multiple crisis uh, sunk in, and that, that too, that context too, form number four in this, uh, in this uh, uh, analysis of causation. Fifthly, there is of course a tradition, there's a fifth element here, which is that Britain has never been as engaged and as committed to the European project as other member states. It has seen the project largely in empirical terms as a matter of economic advantage for the country, which ironically is still the case, or was still the case at the time of the vote, in that we were benefiting from our role as the financial center of Europe, um, a role which we have now at the very least jeopardized, we may even have ended it, but probably not, but we've certainly damaged it enormously. But nevertheless, our emotional attachment, our passion attachment, our romantic attachment, not absolutely lacking amongst Britons, but relatively speaking, the EU was seen as a, a necessary evil rather than as a positive project. So we have five causations. In my mind, there are many, many more. There are other ways of looking at it. Turning now to the future, briefly. Um, I think what has happened uh, and what is happening now, the, the way in which the, uh, the Tory government is, as it were, expanding the, the disaster which it created into a project of, uh, ex of nationalism. I won't say extreme, but certainly worrying notes in the palette of the picture it seems to be painting of its role on the country it wants to uh, it wants to create. Um, this, uh, this, I think, will, will swing back in time. I think the fact that 48% of Britons voted to remain, that many people who voted to leave are now doubtful, that there are certainly many people who are very concerned about some of the directions that the recent Tory party conference seemed to suggest mean that there will be a new balance in time and that 
if and when, and I think it's a question of when rather than if, the damaging economic consequences of our decision become clear to ordinary voters, there will be a move towards some kind of rapprochement, some return to the European Union. Full membership, again, probably not a political reality in any short-term future, but a particularly close association, probably yes. And I would end by, by uh, recalling something that was said about Canada at the time when Quebec was close to taking a decision for independence. And one journalist said to another, my God, Quebec's going to leave Canada. To which the other journalist replied, oh yes, where's it going then? <laughs> and that's true of Britain. Oh, where are we going then? You can't vote against geography. So, thank you. <laughs>Thank you, Martin, for this very comprehensive uh, introduction to the subject. And uh, I will now turn to Eva. And uh, when you cast your vote, as I suppose you did, you, did you have one country or two countries in mind? And, uh, and how, how do you see what happened from that perspective? Uh, to be honest, I've had so many brilliant speakers and Martin's description of what happened was so totally brilliant that there is hardly anything to be added, so I don't know, you know what I'm going to say. Well, if you remember, Michael, so I, no, Michale, so I sat with you the night before the Brexit in the library just around the corner, and now I turned up late because I had to go to dinner, and I towards the end of the evening, there was this kind of positive attitude, it is not going to happen. And I was telling everybody my little experience from sitting on the train from the north of England back to London, and having realized on that train that we were going to lose it. And now, why? Because you just hear people, normal people sitting on the train, who are basically unhappy with their life. The milk is too expensive, the bread no, has gone up in price, and the living is unaffordable, the health service doesn't work, and all those things just to create a general attitude so we vote no. We don't have any information what it means because we just are informed by people who are telling us how much money we save if we get out of Brexit. So on all these millions are going to go to National Health Service. All this money, all this money is going to go um, to pay for the education, improvement of uh, the salaries, and so on and so forth. And I have never, ever believed that England was able to make such a mess of the information prior to this uh, uh, vote that nobody really knew what it really meant they voted for. That was, I think, at the part of the issue. Now, you asked me a question, what country or what, I, what countries I had in mind. Well, you know, it is, of course, you know, I left Czech or Czechoslovakia when I was 29, so I was a grown-up person. I grew up through, I was born when the Second World War started, and I lived through the Second World War as a child, I lived through a very short period of my democratic republic and I left through communism and I left. And as a matter of fact, the reason why I couldn't come back, which I would have done under normal circumstances, was that I joined the Society for Human Rights without really knowing what it meant. You know, so I just signed a document because one does, when you are young, if you are against the regime. So I did exactly what most of the people did with Brexit. I signed a document asking me to join the Organization for Human Rights. It sounded 
right. And it was against the regime, so I did it. Of course, when I got to England, so the Czech embassy found out that I was on the list and they abolished my passport and made me stateless. So thanks God for that, because otherwise my life would have probably finished in Czech prison and no, I would have never had any opportunity to not to be professional. But going back to, going back to Brexit, you know, I, I knew exactly that it was going to happen, even if I tried to be an optimist because I had that feeling, you know, when you are working with people in the trade, lots of people are making our buildings, lots of people are working on our shops and projects. Those people were all voted for Brexit. And, you know, there are really people who need help. They are not people who make money because they were completely brainwashed by those people who do make money and people who used it in their own interest, like the names Nigel Farage and so on and so forth. Um, it, you know, just of having spent so much time teaching and working in our office, there is always a foreign student and now we have got Czech students, we have got now Israeli students, we have got um, um, we had students from uh, Spain, Europe, America, from all over the place. This cross fertilization on the scientific, professional, artistic level is so terribly important. When I came to England, you know, in 1968, people were looking at me like a strange animal. I do remember I was taken by my friends to lunch and one of the ladies came out of 16th century beautiful cottage, looked at me from the bottom to the top and she said, but she looks like us, you know, because I came from the, the country behind the Iron Curtain. This argument has gone now. We all do look the same, you know, so, and now we are just going to fill endless forms if we ask for students, if we ask for any research people to come to the country and so on and so forth. But I think that um, one can't be always negative, so maybe that something good will come out of it. And I would just have liked to mention we were having a little, a little discussion uh, uh, before and uh, the, uh, there was a uh, discussion about the walls this morning, how many walls were built. And it just of somehow crossed my mind. I happened to be as a student in East Berlin in 1961 in August when we were as students locked up in the basement of the hostel and we were watching Russian soldiers marking on the Unter den Linden. And then we were put on the bus and taken back because we, there was still, the wall was not built overnight. It took some time. So in order not to make sure that we would not escape, so they, in spite of the fact it was half of the trip, so they took us back straight to, to Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia, I keep saying wrong thing. And I happened, by pure coincidence, to be in West Berlin again when the wall came down. And there is one thing which uh, I think that you have to now close your eyes and have a little bit of imagination. There is an artist called um, Baxi, and he does strange things. He veils graffitis on important buildings and important places and he sends kind of strange messages to people. And this guy, who nobody knows who he really is, just sort of took a picture of the, another wall, which was built between Israel and Palestine. Big concrete wall. And on this wall, he drew a picture of a big hole. And behind that big hole, there is a little sand pit. And there is a tiny little boy with a little shovel, and he plays on a sandpit, view, beautiful uh, blonde um, hair and blue eyes, sky above him. And this artist, he just of made a hole in that wall. And I think that through the culture and through every single individual, and what I think that Havel said on this a uh, little note, what love can do. So I think that eventually it will be probably an uncomfortable and maybe even slightly painful journey, but maybe it'll shake 
the Europe up and maybe something good comes out of it. So, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> well, I actually think that you've said quite a lot and, uh, and uh, we'll come back uh, to that in a, in a little moment. I, I have a couple of questions for, for each of you and uh, things that concern me or bother me about Brexit and uh, and the first would be about the sequence. And uh, you, uh, you did refer to Jeremy Corbyn and, uh, and, uh, and Cameron as uh, you know, the two people who, had, uh, 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 who bore the most responsibility for uh, what happened. And I wouldn't uh, argue the point on, uh, on, uh, on either side, but uh, you did not refer to, to Nigel Farage and uh, for me he was also a part of the sequence because he caused the split or crisis within the Conservative Party that, uh, that uh, in turn uh, made uh, Cameron to look for a, a position that he thought was a winning position to to go for the referendum and, and win it on, uh, on the Remain side. So, uh, uh, the role of UKIP, uh, 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 do you think it will continue in the, uh, in the negotiations that will start next March, as the Prime Minister uh, declared? Will UKIP play an active role or will it just try to benefit from the situation. And uh, my second, and that's a puzzle for me, because, and that's about migrants, that's about uh, uh, much of the campaign before the referendum was about the uh, migrant labor from the EU member countries, mostly from our part of, uh, of the EU. Some of it was quite unpleasant, etc., etc. And if you lived like I did for six years in Britain, or if you live in Britain, you can't help notice that a majority of uh, immigrants in Britain are from other parts of the world than, uh, than uh, uh, Eastern Europe. And in some respects, they, uh, they constitute uh, maybe more of social problems or uh, cultural problems than, than uh, the migrants from our part of Europe. And uh, Brexit will do nothing about those problems. I mean, they, they had existed before, will continue to exist afterwards. So, uh, can you enlighten me on, on, on this paradox? Well, you want me to... Yes, and I will then move on to, to, to Eva. Well, you, obviously, Michael, you're quite right to, uh, to mention UKIP. I was trying to keep the cast of criminals down to a manageable size. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I think UKIP would not have been such a factor had those other elements in the changing chemistry of British politics not allowed it to, to emerge as the catalyst that it undoubtedly was for some of the decision-making by the much bigger actors. So that would be my reaction to, to that, um, uh, to that point. As to UKIP's future, I think we can already see uh, uh, in, in, in the European Parliament how that party is in the process of collapsing from its own internal contradictions, its own, its own serious inanity, its lack of weight, its lack of depth, its lack of serious figures. The one-man show and the one man is uh, careering off into the distance, probably because he knows in his heart that it's all over. Um, and I think, therefore, that UKIP is not going to be a big factor. It, except in the sense that Mrs. May is tempted to steal some of UKIP's clothes. Some of the UKIP clothes that the Conservative Party has not already stolen, to steal some more. 
And those are the worrying tendencies. That's part of the worrying side of the, uh, of the recent Tory conference, that it suggests that may be a possible direction that the Tory government will go in. Uh, as to the broader, the broader point of why British people voted for on the issue of migration in a pattern which suggests they didn't know what they were doing. So for instance, uh, but this is familiar from other countries too, the vote for Brexit uh, was higher in areas where there are no or few immigrants than it is in, was in areas where there are high numbers of immigrants. And why they voted, um, that's the first element of irrationality in that kind of motivation, and why they voted about something they thought they could control, i.e. immigration, immigration from other EU countries rather than immigration from outside Europe, um, it's almost certainly that for many people the two are just aggregated in their mind. They don't grasp that they're unrelated. Um, and so you get a combination of two irrationalities, voting against migrants when you've never even seen one, and voting against fellow Europeans when what you're really worried about, if you are worried, or if you ought to be worried, are people from Africa and the Middle East. This isn't to say, and one has to add, I think, that a generalized worry about, about migrants from, from outside of the European Union, as Michael Ignatiev said this morning, is not something real. And so, I'm not saying that this worry about migration in Britain was all unreal wasn't all unreal, but it was very diffuse. It was the dangerous, dangerous irresponsibility of politicians like Farage, Johnson, and so on, who took this floating discontent, including the things you're talking about, prices up, jobs down, and uh, focused it uh, in this way. Uh, there's a Thai proverb which says a politician is like a man in a, in a fast-flowing river in a boat with no oars who is looking for an oar. Yeah. Immigration was the oar. Yeah. Well, the fear of the unknown is, uh, is a fact that uh, I think can be dissent in, in many of these uh, situations. Uh, we, our experiences, not just in Britain, but in and around Europe, in, in this country, I think it has a particular form of the fear of Muslims because for uh, reasons of history, uh, you know, this country has hardly ever experienced uh, any uh, real Muslims. We didn't have an empire, we didn't have a coast. Uh, uh, the Ottoman Empire has never reached uh, all the way uh, up to here. So for most Czechs, a Muslim is an abstract you know, concept that you can fill in with any uh, content uh, you wish, and if uh, you're helped uh, by some of the real uh, uh, evil things committed by some of the Muslims uh, uh, these days, by the media and by some of the politicians, then you get the, you know, picture of the, the same kind of pictures there existed in the western part of the United States in the 19th century about the yellow threat of, uh, you know, the horde of Chinese coming in uh, from uh, the Pacific and, uh, and overwhelming the country. So, but I will move to you, Eva, mm, following the Brexit and, you know, yes, you, 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 you are absolutely right in reminding me of the evening uh, we, which we called the Brexit Vigil on the 23rd of, uh, of June where, where we sat in the library and, and dissolved the meeting at around 2 o'clock in the morning, certain that everything was going well uh, for, for the Remain uh, part and uh, you were one of the few people apparently who was right in fearing Brexit because neither the polls 
uh, did point to a Brexit, and this time, exceptionally for Britain, even the bookmakers yeah. did not, uh, <laughs> did not you know, point to the <laughs> Brexit. They all got it wrong, you got it right. But following Brexit, uh, we read that there were a number of stories about uh, uh, things that I personally never witnessed in, in, in Britain, you know, uh, physical attacks against uh, 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 migrants from uh, Central and Eastern Europe, variable attacks, etc., etc. Uh, uh, and some of it I'm sure you can discount as, as you know, tabloid sensation seeking, but some of it apparently was real. Uh, so did you come close hand to, to, to some of this and could you tell us more about it? And my second question is more of a philosophical kind and it's about the walls. And you are, you know much better than I then that, you know, walls do not exist primarily to divide people. You know, they exist primarily to support structures and, uh, and uh, make uh, our environment uh, uh, livable. And even this, this wall in, in Jerusalem that I also lived close to for a number of years is, and it's a very ugly thing, the wall, uh, if it's not nicely painted over. Uh, but uh, Israelis uh, will often tell you that they recognize the ugliness of it, but that it's there to uh, prevent people from killing each other, uh, which uh, I think is uh, at least in part a, a point, and, and certainly the, uh, uh, the little boy, you know, 100 meters from the wall is on either side is safer when the wall is there than, uh, than if it were not. I mean, it's, uh, it may be sad, but uh, uh, that's a reality. So can we think of uh, uh, good walls that, uh, that you know, we could uh, give some uh, meaning in the future to uh, connect us rather than divide us? Well, I think that if I start with the walls, I think that the wall is basically built to protect somebody from the wolves or somebody from, from a disaster. It could be a natural disaster, it could be people. And uh, I think that walls probably don't actually, you know, supporting walls like these two walls, they are doing a very good job and have been doing it for the centuries. So I think that I would keep those, but um, the walls, whether it was the Berlin Wall, whether it is the wall between Palestine and Israel, and they are just of kind of um, philosophically, I think, a disastrous um, confirmation of the fact that we cannot resolve human problems by diplomacy, talking, education, that we failed. I think, it, I think it to me that wall is symbolically a failure mm. of all us human beings not being able to do our job properly, bring up the children and so on. And now I think it so I would not agree with building another wall and I think that if they had been built, so I would really try to get them down as quickly as possible. But going back to the first question, you know, when I came to England from um, a dictatorship regime, from a communist country, I was absolutely amazed how good English people were to refugees, how immigrants, people in need, you know, how much Britain as such, you know, have been helping. Not that it would have been very difficult to get a British passport. I think that I had to wait for, I was stateless, I had a travel document for a long time. And which is a UNESCO kind of passport for stateless people. And eventually, I think that I managed to get a British passport in 1976. So it was a long process, long investigation. But the kindness which I did experience, and not only me, but lots of other people from different parts of the country, it was something which I really remember and I will never forget. 
On the other hand, what surprised me with Nigel Farage and this situation now is that this kind of suddenly, this bad nationalistic um, uh, evil has been woken up, you know, so, and it seems to impress people who, as Martin says, have never seen a refugee. You know, lots of people did not. I think that, you know, if I just look at Britain, so when you go to hospital, how many British nurses you find? If you uh, go to any building industry site, how many British people are working on building sites? It is, you know, if you go to even, you know, our metal workers who initially voted for Brexit, 50% of the employees are skilled people from elsewhere. So suddenly, in spite of all that, you know, so suddenly there is this kind of negative element which has surfaced. And it, it really hurts me. And I have to, I finished because I, I, I talk too much, but when the Brexit happens and when I was sitting at the airport catching the plane back the following morning after <laughs> our vigil, so I was getting on my mobile phone messages from my really brilliant British friends. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so ashamed of being British. Well, that still says something about good British people and Britishness. <laughs> and, uh, and I just of seeing that this element hopefully will prevail and so Nigel Farage will hopefully <laughs> just <laughs> burn his own oil because it is a catastrophe. But how many people still support him? You know, when you listen to television and when people, um, journalists put microphone in front of uh, somebody a mouse in a shopping, shopping mall. Who are you going to vote for? Nigel Farage, because he actually reads our mind. He supports us, the people. You know, that is frightening. Has the, has the level of negative energy risen since, since Brexit in, you know, in the general public? Or? There have certainly been some incidents, some in involving nationals of this country. Uh, <clears throat> but my feeling is there's not been a great change. Uh, there's not been a great change, or if there has been a, a relatively a spurt in that sort of incident, it will be dealt with by the authorities, by the police and so on. And it will be dealt with by ordinary British people who uh, I, I don't like that kind of behavior. Um, they don't like that kind of yobbish behavior, whoever it's directed at. And our traditions of hospitality to foreigners and strangers are, in my view, not dead. I just, I hesitate to say a word in, in defense of Nigel Farage, but I would just point out that he campaigned against the European Union, not against Europeans. He's married to a German. He, he, he seems to be extremely fond of Europe in the, on one level. Um, Boris Johnson, of course, is quite a European figure. He speaks two or three European languages. He knows uh, the Brussels scene very well. It's complicated, but uh, I think Britons still feel, still have warm feelings towards uh, 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 other European societies, all of them, different, refracted through different aspects of our common history. Our, my bilateral histories with different countries, and I don't think those will go away. Uh, I don't see huge walls going up between Britain and the continent. I'm sure bureaucracy will increase, and there will be problems in all kinds of areas, science, the professions, and so on, and they'll be irritating, just as they were in the past. I mean, I remember going to France and having to queue outside the police station all day to get my my residence stamp and so on. Uh, those kind of irritations will unfortunately, to some extent, return. But they are just irritations. I, know, I see no real reason why there should be a diminution of the warmth of uh, relations between Britons and other Europeans. It depends though, to some extent, on how the European project proceeds, which, you know, we're getting off uh, we're leaving it, sadly. You're going, all going on with it. Uh, if it's 
to be made into a success. If it's to cope with the problems that we've been talking about today, and if it does it well, that will, <laughs> that will make you know, the process of reintegrating Britain in some form all the more possible. Yeah. Well, yeah, we, we here on the continent don't seem to be doing such a great job of getting on with it uh, ourselves at the moment, so I think we, we both have a job on our hands. And, uh, and I absolutely agree that uh, uh, for the uh, damages or consequences from the Brexit to be kept to uh, the uh, minimum, it will take not just uh, the United Kingdom's government to take a very pragmatic and uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, positive approach to the negotiations, but for the Europeans as well. And, uh, and it's not just a question of preserving a good relationship with uh, Europe and preserving good life for the migrants on both sides, because we also shouldn't forget that there are about two million Britons uh, uh, mostly uh, retirement age uh, uh, people living in uh, all countries of southern Europe and uh, and they also want to uh, have as little red tape uh, as uh, as possible in future but it's also I think uh, our internal need to look at uh, uh, how we going about building the project at the moment and whether we should not review and reform some of our own policies to uh, make uh, uh, the European project sustainable uh, with or without Britain. And uh, that's, uh, uh, that's another serious question. But coming back to Britain, also what strikes me as, uh, as uh, a potential problem is that you know, one division usually leads to other divisions. And if one looked at the breakdown of the uh, uh, vote from the referendum, you know, there were several uh, striking divisions between young and old, between urban and country, between uh, uh, north and south, between Scotland and England and Wales and even between the Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland, uh, which is another ominous uh, 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 division. Uh, so, uh, can these be mitigated? Uh, uh, will they <coughs> dissipate in time, or, or, or are they cause for, for real concern? Is it me? <laughs> it's both of you. I'm, I'm an optimist. <laughs> I think that, in, uh, you know, so, um, people react to whatever situation they are supposed to show their um, opinion to, or express their opinion, rather. And then they calm down, so, and now they just have seen that my grandfather used to say that the bird is like a pendulum, it goes to the right, and when it finds out, then there is nothing much to and uh, to get from, so it swings and it goes to the left and then goes back and so on. So I don't think that it's, uh, it is going to be uncomfortable, but I think that eventually, hopefully, um, the, the awareness of these facts, I think it will help to solve the problems. And because it, there is still a huge amount of people who really mean well, who are positive, and who mm, just do anything under any situation to make it better. And I think that one has to hope that, uh, and support those people, not only hope, you know, so, but um, physically, mentally, do something that these people will get a voice. And then, of course, it will start with education, and eventually, I think it was people growing up and learning that what they have voted for is actually not the answer to the problem of expensive milk or bread. So I think it may well probably calm down. 
And, you know, and I just would like to add, because this morning there were so many brilliant suggestions about, because we are talking about human rights, and it is connected to human rights and this kind of irritating problem of what to do with refugees and are they going to kill us all or not. There is just of one problem which I think that not only European nations but also the rest of the world could help. You know, when you have millions of people who become stateless, millions of people who are leaving their country on the boats, half of them losing their lives, this terrible, terrible misery, you know, which is then followed by terrible detention centers, terrible camps when those people are housed. Well, we can deal with armies who are fed, clothed, and who are looked after. Can't we actually, you know, not only Europe, but can the rest of the world do something that these people, at least for the interim period, for the period, I don't know how, it might be years, it might be in the time before somebody checks their papers or somebody decides about their future. At least when they live in human conditions. And I think that that would really be the first step, you know, just of on the way to the future, because it is really, you know, I, we had this absolutely brilliant woman this morning standing up here in front of us, just of being able to face the world after her terrible, terrible life story. I had a few weeks ago in England another woman giving a very similar story, which was followed by an even more terrible story, well, it was more terrible because at least it was safe, but it was a story what she suffered and how long she suffered from going through British detention centers. You know, and these people who are, you know, who are in Greece or Italy or God knows where, you know, being half alive, children, so, you know, I think that this is what the world could do, and this is, I think, possible. And I just hope, hopefully, maybe somebody may join me in these thoughts. I, I'm completely hopeless and helpless, but no, I think that maybe that no, something could at least, you know, um, be noticed that there is a little help which might actually you know, help to solve the situation. Well, of course, I second all that. I, I just point to one fundamental uh, problem in Britain, and I think it's also a problem in other, some other parts of Europe, and that is the, the way in which the changes in our economy have, we speak of refugees, quite rightly, refugees coming from outside the European Union to us and the terrible circumstances they live in. There are some ways in which we turn parts of our own populations into refugees in their own country and that the loss of manufacturing in Britain, for instance, has meant that the whole framework in which the British working class lived, prospered, and I was able to, from a relatively secure base, have those feelings of tolerance and welcome for others, has been undermined. And this probably ultimately, in my mind, is what people like Farage are appealing to. They're appealing to that sense of loss, displacement. We haven't got a world like we used to have. We haven't got all the obvious things, secure employment, good employment, pride in good jobs, uh, proper trade unions that are still working, still have some power, all these things that have, have been on the way out in many of our countries, and in particular in Britain. So this internal decline of Britain is, is, is one of the aspects. So you might say one of the positive things, if you wanted to look at the positive side of what Mrs May has been saying, is that we really do need in Britain to attend to our manufacturing problems, our training problems and our educational problems to restore to our own people that sense of possession. And this, I think, is what most people at some level, why they responded to the phrase, give us, we've got our country back, give us our country back. They wanted a country they remembered. 
through very rosy spectacles, but nevertheless they remembered where things were better for them. And until we attend to the fundamental causes of why they have got worse for them, not only in Britain, but in the United States and in many other places, we'll probably go on having problems like these in different forms all over Europe, all over the West. Indeed. Uh, questions? Please. Good afternoon. I would like to link up with uh, what Mrs. Jiřičná has been saying. Would one of the solutions wouldn't be to have more women involved, more women at the top-ranking positions? Because we often hear that the 21st century should be the century of women government. I have read it somewhere. I can't remember. For Eva, are you running for the president next year? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> no, but can I just say that it is a very nice thought, but I think it depends, you know, because if on one hand you have Angela or Angela Merkel, and on the other hand you might have Miss May, or, and so I'm not so sure which one way is positive. I'm not sure about the other one. You know, sometimes women, uh, yeah, most of the women, I think, it, you know, I can just, of, I'm an architect and I only judge it from professional practice because I've got women and men working in the office and I've been watching them at my age for a very long time. There is a difference, both approach differently, but I think that you need a balance of both to have a successful result at the end, so I would vote for that. <laughs> Well, Eva, can I say a couple of words in defense of your Prime Minister? I, I had the uh, luck to speak uh, with her at the Nicholas Winter Memorial uh, in uh, uh, London earlier this year. I think it was two weeks before she was appointed Prime Minister. And given some of the alternatives, you know, she struck me as a rather level-headed uh, uh, you know, lady that uh, will do her best to avoid some of the extremes, and uh, uh, which is uh, more than I can say for some of uh, uh, male politicians in other countries. I will not, uh, I will not name names. So, uh, another question. Yes. No. All right, no question on the left-hand side here. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kamel Uvin. I have a question. You call it catastrophe, this events in Britain, uh, but you still have a NATO. Uh, the Queen is still there. Why do you call it so negatively that it was a, such a catastrophe? I would like to ask uh, if... Why do you call it a catastrophe? <laughs> That's my question. Thank well, I you. think that uh, at least I don't hear anyone at the panel using the word catastrophe. Uh, uh, catastrophe is the name of a play by Samuel Beckett that played in the National Theatre here last uh, weekend, but uh, uh, I think we were speaking about problems and consequences and concerns, and, and I think Brexit is a cause for all this. I, I, I would refrain from calling it a catastrophe, but I don't know about our panelists. Well, I use the word disaster, which is on the same <laughs> spectrum, but not. <laughs> I think I wouldn't use the word catastrophe because I think that, um, well, <clears throat> history seems to suggest that we do exaggerate the seriousness of the crises we encounter. And in retrospect, not all of them, but many of them, in, in re retrospect, they, they shrink in importance. I'm not saying this will, it, it may, that rather depends on what happens on each side of the channel, as we've been saying. 
I don't think it's a catastrophe. I hope I haven't used the word catastrophe. It is inconvenient from my point of view. It's not objective, it's subjective. Um, I admit, I, I think it, uh, it was unfortunate that David Cameron called uh, the election. I think that he shouldn't have done after Scotland, you know, so he should have learned a lesson. But um, it happened, and I think that now, in, you know, in Moravia and probably so it happened in Czech, they say, tak už se stalo. Um, so it means, you know, what has been done cannot be undone. And after all, I don't know who said it, but the beautiful water lily only opens up if, it, if the roots are growing out from the mud. So um, there is a hope. <laughs> you know, we might even flood it at the end of it. So it all right. Positive. So it seems to be a consensus of the panel that it may be that Brexit may be a disaster, but it's not a catastrophe. <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you just reminded me of, of another thing that maybe uh, uh, would be appropriate to, to say in closing. Uh, you and I and a uh, few other uh, uh, people, personalities in this country had been involved in a rather chaotic effort to prevent Brexit by writing an open letter to uh, the British people through also a Zlín-born Czech-British playwright Tom Stoppard, which The Guardian also uh, covered uh, at the time. And in the letter we uh, didn't try to uh, advise the British people on how to vote in the referendum, but we tried to uh, explain uh, why, uh, why we need them and why we like them and uh, we may have uh, lost uh, uh, that fight but I think I am speaking on behalf of many people in this room that uh, even though we lost it we still need uh, uh, the British people and we still like them. So thank you very much, have thank you, you all. You wanted to say something? Yes, please. So on a funny note, have you, in, have you noticed how important Zlin is? Donald Trump's wife, first wife, is from Zlin. Tom Stoppard is from Zlin. And I was born in Zlin too, so and, <laughs> and of course, And of course, Thomas Batya was also Thomas. born in Zlin. Otherwise, we would all be walking barefoot. So, thank you. <laughs>